Next person to be speaking uh, in this session is Liana Borghi. Uh, Liana Borghi has researched and taught Anglo-American literature at the University of Firenze until 2010. Uh, she's a founding member of La Libreria delle Donne <laughs> in Florence. Um, she, she's been active in the international lesbian movement since the late 70s and has worked ever since on GLTQ studies attempting cross-cultural trans-feminist, trans-queer feminist entanglements with literature, history, science and arts. And she'll be speaking on uh, if love is a time machine, effective temporalities in intimate relations. So thank you. Okay. Um, I will... Since we've been talking poetry, I shall start with two lines from poem 19 of the 21 Love Poems by Adrian Rich, where she says, uh, Two women together is a work nothing in civilization has made sinful. And after that, I shall ask you to think with me just for a second and to imagine a couple of birds, a couple of trees, a couple of things, a couple of days, a couple of women. Any of those can be different, behave differently to and from one another, and at any moment as we look, they may pair off. Well, I share the conviction that it is necessary to deconstruct the normative disposition of this standard couple as a staple figuration of heteropatriarchy and decolonize its concept, practice, and performance in order to change our heteronormative social structure uh, male, female, gendered, heterosexual, monogamous, partnered, you know, all the stable identities we're familiar with. But there can be a lot that is not normative in a couple, and lesbian couples can certainly produce, I quote, diverse, intimate relations. We've been talking about that in our meeting yesterday. Um, the object called lesbian couple describes the coming together of two persons that identify or are identified as lesbians. It can be seen as an attachment, an affiliation, an effective political format, a symbolic asset, a construct, an environment, a space of coexistence, the site of small achievements, a temporary housing, a temporal sedimentation, or an unforeclosed experience providing reassurance, visibility, upward mobility, job security, political social equality, lively, uh, durable intimacy, and much more. Coupling is a performance. And what does a couple do? It performs itself. It transmits affective contagion, suggestion, and imitation. It may represent, under constant revision, a mutual affect with expectations and fantasies of ordinary good life. In the generalized format, Couples can be of all shapes and color, queer and mixed. The intersection factor covers complexities like, like ethnicity, sex, age, religion, language, the time, space, position and performance within the private sphere and in public appearance because the global script of the couple also comes in many different formats and relationships. Coupling is, however, a temporal genre. It exists in time, it has a time of being, an affective time being. If it comes about because two women are in love, it is susceptible of waning when we fall out of love. Of course, it is not only love that brings about a couple. Many different aspects and calculations can produce that arrangement, as well as other ways of organizing our erotic, sexual, and emotional lives. Couples, families, and dis-families can be created both from relations not limited to blood ties and also from homonormative choices, not heterosexual relationships resembling heterosexual ones. And a, a triad can function as a, serial as a serial couple, experimenting free love forms of being sexual or asexual. The desire to belong and to be attached to one or more persons and to the commons usually dovetails with the desire to detach and regain one's individual sovereignty, 
which requires negotiating terms of fidelity, attention, recognition, duration, space, caring and providing. As we know, intimate relations are also defined by economic and political models of bargaining. Pooling resources has been for ages a, de a decisive economic factor for single women of all classes who have shared resources, affects, intimacy and beddings, like for instance uh, the ladies of Langlochen, but also my great aunt in Pisa, Italy, with her girlfriends. We know all this because issues of partnership are an intelligible part of our lives. No matter what sexual inclinations we pursue, we are familiar with the never experienced sublime of romance and wholehearted belonging that steers us towards expectations of long-term entanglements. Sampling my own experience as a scholar activist, I remember the early trends in my lesbian community of the late 70s and 80s, our reliance on the support of alternative families of choice which we map mapped in mock genealogical trees, and the commitment to resist collectively forms of homophobic discrimination and slow violence at home and abroad, affirming with pride and courage our sexual dissidents, first of all in our hometown. When, with the moving van ready to turn the one-night stand into a couple them, we also constantly debated visibility and invisibility, the problems of the coming out, our experiments and experiences of intimacy, closed, open relationships, short or long-term alliances, the heartache of betrayals, infidelity, separations, long-distance love affairs, etc. And I also remember the animating political desire in our small communities, possibly feeding on our very limited but shared financial resources, the collective desire to make a better world for the affects we shared, a world we could live in as dykes, with a fantasy of a good communal life sustained minimally by existing social infrastructures, and above all by our connections with friends and with past, present and future lovers. Since then, the narrative has somewhat changed, not just the vocabulary, but the performances in context. We used to have turkey basters, now we have assisted reproduction, and our committed <coughs> ceremonies can now become partnerships or marriages in several countries, Italy almost included. <laughs> and since then, in the depoliticized turn, emotional bonds have also waned. Families considered permanent and reliable have fallen apart, disintegrated, recombining occasionally in small core groups that meet for birthdays and regroup for some important event in town like a women's or a queer film festival. Faces and bodies recognizable among strangers. If we ask, how come? The answer is, we are busy, there's no time, there are problems, things are tough. But of course, some of the early ones still do gay prides and big cultural events in other cities, connecting with a larger LGTQI national community, domesticated, most of the early lesbians I know are coupled and shared housing. In the loose grapevine broadcast by Facebook, every breakup creates empathic ripples in the posts. Curiosity about the follow-up sometimes offers of support and companionship. But, really, a lot has changed because of the pressures of austerity measures in the neoliberal scenarios we live in. In the context of our virtual intimacies and transnational movements, the homonotional and homonormative request for sexual integration and rights feeds optimistic expectations of changing the homo heteronormative and pink-washed socio-political climate. Some of the Italian lesbians I know have already married abroad but are waiting for the new law on civil partnerships to become effective. It has been argued that the cultural meaning of lesbians and gays is becoming more a social than a heterosexual, uh, sorry, than a sexual category. Hence, the normative emphasis on the gender conventional on the couple and marriage. And although many of us do endorse that form of state normalization, the partnered or married same-sex couple has become, I quote Sarah Med, 
the object, the vehicle that promises happiness oriented towards objects that function as social goods, including individual resources, survivors' pension, sexual freedom of the partners, in Italy, no fidelity clause, social visibility, mutual aid and care at the time of a fast disappearing welfare state, but it doesn't include in Italy again a stepchild adoption. To many of us, a legal civil partnership seems a meager compensation for the spreading neoliberal privatizations, the neocolonial and xenophobic war cries, and the rampant no gender theory campaign that is forcing fundamentalist Catholic and new right conformity inside our schools. If this dismal scenario prompts us to review our progress and rethink our lesbian performativity in temporal terms, we may also notice that LBTQ public discourse and manifestos seem to address a population enjoying everlasting youth. One may have and have been a child, but nobody gets old. Yet many of us living in the limelight of the new queer movement and supporting it actively are part of an earlier generation. As individuals or as queer subjects, we are obviously the product of temporal sedimentation. Aging is a structural element in life that should be integrated, represented and made legible as such in our communities. But alongside other disabilities, illness included, together with inequalities like poverty and social <coughs> exclusion, aging is treated as uninteresting, depressing, marginal, discountable, or rather as absent. Since the informal network of support, solidarity and care shared with near and dear friends in former times has dwindled, it is heartening to see non-normative communities that explore, uh, as, as Marx Chiaramenti has done and is doing in Bologna, the possibility of organizing resistant and alternative social relational networks. But there is still a pressing need of institutional assistance, no matter how reluctant we may be to trust institutionalization and assimilation into the homophobic regime of bodily production and social assistance of our inadequate <coughs> democracies. And in order to resist this, we need couples, ex-lovers, close friends, and more friends. Predictably, even though some of us have moved beyond structuralist accounts of kinship towards embodied affective life and multiple temporalities, <coughs> understanding sexuality and sexual practices as socially constructed and relative to a given time space. And although we are changing the heteronormative script towards a transformation of intimacy and a radical pluralism of choices and relationships, despite our efforts, Traditional partnerships and couples will probably continue for a while to exist according to the old happy couple script. <coughs> Lauren Berlant points out the cruelty of optimistic expectations whose realization will in fact bind people to objects that will constrain their freedom. Um, Every day may kill the prospect of the good life offered in matrimony, she writes but it may not kill the treacherous fantasy of the promised happiness adjusted into feeling normal. Her complex narrative of the fallout of the fantasy of happiness evokes many narratives that reflect on affect, and sorry, and affect the transformation of intimacy. As a literary scholar, I am fascinated by the way narratives affect cultural representations and behavior. Narratives are encounters that produce embodiment, affective recognition, and material effects. Thinking back, I'd like to remember that in 1977, Roland Barthes observed that a vast repertoire of images, of images precedes the gay lover's discourse, providing a whole data bank on which to construct imagination and behavior. As if on cue in the early 90s, Anthony Giddens, giving a historical account of the transformation of intimacy, wrote that the, begin, that the beginning of the novel in the 18th century coincided with the social affirmation of romantic love, which integrated the self and the other through a very innovative private narrative connecting freedom and self-realization. It was an epochal social change initiating by women's fiction. More recently, again Lauren Berlant, 
observes that we live performing genre and scripts and that love is an institutional format of desire. While Gloria Becker recommends that we research cultural archives as a reservoir of old images and new knowledge because they reveal structures of feeling, of knowing, of affect that may change our Western perception of reality. An observation which she applies to the polyamorous sexual culture of the Mati working class women she has studied with in the Caribbean. Many people do perform coupling in open transit, multiple relationships and partnerships, opting for non-traditional ways to organize life even within the structural constraints of the heteropatriarchal figuration of the couple. Coupling implies renouncing one's individual sovereignty in order to share time, space, and to enjoy a feeling of belonging and of emotional continuity. Over the past few years, queer studies have moved from theories of representation to theories of affect, with a turn to temporal studies focusing on the affective implications of our living asynchronously within sociopolitical environments that do not provide alternative narratives for our life spaces. So, we may want and need to investigate the temporal structure of coupledom when and if outer pressures to conform are discounted, how and when we construct and maintain intimacy from within the relationship, sharing different histories, and how the different temporalities we experience may lead to a more critical and realistic view of the social spaces we inhabit. Trying to be queer in queer relationships implies for some of us a becoming, or rather an unbecoming together, as we resist the given identity patterns of hetero futurity and cope with the inner and outer workings of social unintelligibility, as we practice impropriety in the relationship, explore circuits of, circuits of attachment and repair, rethink modes of effective production in non-teleological modes. Querying partnering, working against closure in disrupting traditional attitudes, and seeking polymorphous and non-reproductive pleasures cannot ignore the intimate dissonance and uncrystallized self-definitions that make up our personalities. No matter what position we assume in a particular sexuality, we identify across entangled definitional lines marked by hesitations, deferrals, sociopolitical commitments. Some of us manage to disidentify, abandon object orientation and pursue the nomadism of desire, finding adequate narrative forms for the unplumbed variety that intimacy will take, and accepting the contradictions and aporias of the here and now. What kind of commitment do we make then? Seeking consensual effective relations that we can trust. Is that enough? to provide an enduring good life. Partnering implies multiple paradigms of relationality and a circuit of attachment and repair within the circulation of affects. In, this, in his discourse on negativity, Lee Edelman underlines that loss is a constant factor in relationality. Any object is contingent, subject to wear and tear, yet agent in the disjoint temporality, whereby we attribute retroactive meaning to events. Any historical moment, points out Tim Dean, is crisscrossed by incomparable, sorry, incompatible temporalities. So is every relationship. Which temporality, or how many of them, are being lived in the separate yet joined lives of a coupled pair? Which timeline are they inhabiting together? Which timeline is being created as we exchange life stories that retroactively make sense of past events, reorganizing them as the fabric of our partnering? If we submit the relationship to a reparative reading of the multiple temporalities that partners experience well together, time can help reimagine the project of living perceive untried ways, discover what has not been legible so far, hidden under prejudices, stereotypes, social prescriptions. 
I will take you back in time with me for one last paragraph. And I have a picture. On the front of an ancient temple I recently saw in Asia, a carved stone face grinned at me with sharp teeth. Somebody said, that is the image of time. It eats you up as it eats itself up. It eats you up and is eaten by you. The same happens, I thought, to relationships and to us partners. Whether we guard our affects remaining single and unattached, or fall prey to twosomes of multiple arrangements, the object we make or love is a time machine. <laughs>